Boom, That's boom. better. Good. That's so, better. yeah. So, Doug, do you want to introduce Martin? You bet. You bet. Wonderful. Um, hi, Martin. Uh, um, for everybody else, uh, Dr. Martin Bridge uh, is going to talk today. He's a part-time lecturer at UCL's Institute of Archaeology, as well as a partner in the Oxford Dendrochronology Laboratory. He's a, um, he has combined academic study, publishing several journal articles with practical research, mostly on medieval buildings in Britain. Um, uh, and he, he has also published articles on dating doors and chests and has a particular interest in provenancing timber growth areas. Martin has um, presented for us before. Today, we are very pleased to have him back again. Um, his presentation will look at dates accumulated over the last 20 years from post mills showing that most are a collection of several rebuilds and several have surprisingly old main posts. Over to you, Martin. Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, I've obviously put everybody off. There's not too many here. Uh, right, let's see if I can sort the technology. Uh, okay, good. Uh, right, good evening, everybody. Uh, a little bit about post mills, which are particular types of, of windmill, for those who are not familiar with them, which revolve on a large post. And as it says here, um, I have nicked some photos, not many, from websites like this superb one here. It's just too good to, to miss. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking about these post mills a bit. And there's always an argument as to how old are they. And so if you go back in time to this uh, illustration from a Flemish manuscript of the 14th century, um, they have mills looking like this. There's a recognisable post situation here. In fact, if I get this properly, I can do this a bit more. Oh, that doesn't show up very well, does it? Never mind. Um, yeah, this post here, and it looks as in these early ones as if the wind shaft, the bit that carries the sails and the power from them, the, the axle, as it were, is, is horizontal. And obviously that changes later on. But they obviously have a, a very old uh, origin, going back here to the 14th century, probably older than that, but these are the first illustrations. and uh, there's another very similar 14th century illustration here. So we know they've been around a long time, but none of the ones we've got at the moment are as old as this. These were um, basically, well, there's a lot of argument if you read the literature. A lot of people say these were based on ideas that people brought back from the Crusades. But then a whole load of other people say, well, that doesn't actually add up. And it looks as if they were sort of homegrown in Western Europe, um, local inventions where they had no prospect of building a water mill, because of course water mills, we've got records going back far longer than, than any windmill. But the problem with these very early versions was that they had earth fast posts. And you've got a very large body of material sitting on the top of one of these posts, uh, exposed to the weather. So they're quite often rotting and rocking being the main problems, um, making them fall apart. But they get blown over in storms and still do. Um, and another great problem with mills is fire because you get a lot of combustible dust, all this um, wheat flour things going around in the atmosphere, add a spark from something and it can be quite explosive. So a number of them over the years have gone to fire and explosion. And a few technical bits um, for those of you less familiar with post mills. Uh, the sort of post mills we get these days have this large main post and you don't really get an idea of the size from this photo, but this is one of the major elements. And it sits above a couple of cross elements called cross trees and is actually held up by these porter bars that sit on the end of the cross trees. Uh, and wedge up into a bit on the main post, not really shown very well in this photograph. I need a lighter photograph. Um, but it's actually held, it looks as if it's sitting on these cross trees. It's not, because that would probably be all too far rocking and put a lot of weight on here and snap them. Uh, it actually sits about an inch above, or sorry, 25 mil above uh, these cross trees. But of course they fill in with tar and all sorts of things, the area around there to keep the weather out. Um, so quite a, 
um, quite an undertaking building one of these things. And then on top we have a bit which is usually referred to as the buck which rotates around the post and this is a strange view of a buck. This is when the roof has been taken off and it's looking down from above onto the top of the buck and you can see the bit in the middle here where the stone sat uh, for grinding the corn. And this was uh, a place called Drinkstone in Suffolk undergoing repairs back in 2005. And I'll refer to this one later. Um, so we've got this trestle arrangement here. Later on, usually encased in um, a roundhouse to keep the weather off these elements. Usually this is a brick, um, but quite a few are still exposed. And then on the top of this main post, you have another very important large timber called a crown tree. Uh, this is, as you can see, adapted from an illustration in a, a well-known milling book by Stanley Fries. So our two main elements in terms of large timbers are this main post and this cross tree. And I'll be referring to a number of main posts and cross trees as we go through. Okay, these uh, used to be very, very common. Um, for those of us living in the southeast of England, sort of this area here, there were uh, literally hundreds and thousands of them. You can see here this area, Suffolk, this county in eastern England, in the 1830s recorded 430 mills. Uh, there are very few left. Um, so if you sort of multiply that up across Norfolk and Essex and Cambridgeshire and Sussex and Kent and so on, we were looking at thousands and thousands of these things. But of course, as time went on, uh, they declined very rapidly. Once people got to use diesel engines and the like, gave up on the wind power, a lot of them just sat and rotted. Um, and this is a, a, a mill in Suffolk from a friend of mine, Alan Greening, who provided me with this very sad looking tale of woe. Uh, it's what happened to a lot of mills and they just blew over or rotted or people pinched the timber from them and used elsewhere. So not many left. There was a bit of a resurgence in the 1970s of people that uh, realizing that these were disappearing rapidly and they started setting up preservation trusts and being taken over and some of them were repaired and looked at. But my first involvement with windmills came back in 2001, so 20 years ago, and it was back at that one in Suffolk um, Drinkstone Mill. And you can see here there's a, a carved date here of 1689, so it was thought that this was a pretty old mill, but uh, the government body, English Heritage as it was then, wanted to know just how old it really was and whether that 1689 truly related to the, to the timber or whether it was some other event like a ownership change or, or whatever. And this is one of the few mills that escaped a major rebuild in the 19th or 20th centuries. Those that survived were ones that often got totally rebuilt uh, during that period. So this was thought to be one of the old ones with a carved date and I set about um, taking samples to see if we could actually verify that. And I came up with a rather a shock because I took cores from the main post and found that that was a tree that was felled in the winter of 1586 to 87. And there were a couple of other elements which in uh, mill terms are called gel posts. We normally think of gel posts in buildings as holding up tie beams, but in this case, they're holding up a um, couple of support arms called braze, more technical terms we needn't worry with, and I'm not very good on mill technology anyway. Um, but as I say, this very early post, which was a bit of a shock to everybody, I think. And I went back to this mill when I took that photograph that I showed you earlier in 2005. And at the time, I didn't get any further dates. I went because the cladding was all off and you could get it get at the timbers more easily and go in at different angles and so on. But since then, I've reviewed some of the data I had and that cross tree, that large bit that sits on top of the main post that it all hangs on and rotates around. I now have a date for uh, of a tree that was felled in 1661-2 in the winter. So that's new data as yet unpublished, mainly because it has to go through Historic England's screening process and get approved and all that kind of malarkey. Um, so, there's uh, a problem with dating mills in that quite often they're going for strength and so they're using timber that's fast grown 
um, and therefore you don't get many rings. So a lot of the time they're not actually good candidates for dating, but as you'll see, we've had some success. Just a year later, I, uh, I got called in to have a look at this windmill in Sussex, south of London, uh, Nutley Windmill. And there was a story that this was moved here, possibly from near Goudhurst in Kent. So funnily enough, mills move around. And I've got some records of those here. It's not an uncommon experience, as you can see. In 1797, we got a mill moved about 10 miles by a team of 86 oxen. Can you imagine that? Uh, another Sussex example, Crossing Hand Mill has been moved twice, once from Upfield, and then just 13 years later to a second nearby site because trees had grown up around it, stealing its wind. I guess the trees belong to somebody else because you'd think it would be a damn sight easier to cut the trees down than it would to move the mill, but there you go. Uh, Black Boys Mill, another Sussex example. I've taken these from um, a book by Hemming in 1936 on Sussex windmills. Black Boys Mill, Frampilled, built in 1818, moved in 1868. Uh, another one here moved eight miles. This one moved from west of London down to Chatham in Kent, which is east of London, a distance of about 50 miles. So these were important buildings. They were obviously um, economically important and worth a lot. And people therefore put a lot of effort into to moving them around which is quite interesting for me because I'm interested in where timbers came from and, and playing around with the tree ring data. Probably haven't got the, um, the ability to tie them down for these relatively small areas as yet, but uh, interesting nevertheless. Anyway, going back to Nutley, um, found a side girt in that that was dated to 1738 to 70. But again, this big shock of the main post being from a tree that was cut down somewhere between 1533 and 1565. So another 16th century main post. Um, great catalogue tonight, I'm afraid, but it's the, it's the nature of things. This mill, Pitstone Mill in Buckinghamshire, currently owned by the National Trust, um, had a date of 1627 found on one of the timbers. You can't actually read that now. When I went there, you couldn't see this date, but there is a photograph of it in um, Stanley Friese's book, which was published in 1971. It had another carved date on it of November the 29th, 1784, on another structure. Uh, we know that there were a lot of repairs in 1895, so this is another of these with great 19th century input. And then it was severely damaged in a storm in 1902. So we know there are a few bits with these carved dates on, but how much of it is actually old and how much of it is new? I should have said at the beginning, really, that um, the two things that members of the public ask when they come to these mills is A, how does it work? And B, how old is it? And I've already given away the, uh, the sort of ending of that in, in the write up for the talk. But um, as I think you'll see by the end, it's meaningless to ask how old these things are quite often. So guess what? Main post, 16th century, sometime after 1545. Got no sapwood, so we can't pin it down any more than that, but it's almost certainly a 16th century post. We've then got various elements of the framing, the timbers that were felled in the winter of 1595 to six, and more in the spring of 1597. We've got a crown tree from a timber felled in the spring of 1670. And then the cross tree and quarter bars, again, quite often these, these um, the main bits of the trestle like that, 19th century. But the important thing about this is that we've pushed back that, that possible dating from a 17th century to a 16th century, um, at least for the main post. And we've shown up a 1670 phase when they put the crown tree in. But interestingly, none of the dates I obtained relate to any of the dates of the carved timbers, which is slightly annoying, but just goes to show what a jumble we've got. So this is the uh, photo I've pinched from a website and I have given it due acknowledgement at the bottom here. Uh, this is Brill in Buckinghamshire, not far away, again, just west of London. Uh, couldn't resist that photo, it's just so lovely, isn't it? Um, another one thought to date to the 17th century, uh, it's got this beam with this 
68 on, which people have taken to be a date. And in the literature, they say it's uh, something 68 with something after it, but I can't actually see anything after it there until you get over here, which I think has more initials. So I wonder if it was actually um, 1668 rather than 68 in the middle. But anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, Luke Bonwick, who is a millwright who I've done work with in various um, windmills over the past, has started producing diagrams like this, which I think are jolly useful. You just give an outline of the thing and then colour in the timbers for different phases that have actually been dated. And I think this is a nice way of showing it. This one, um, we've got a, an early timber from the 17th century. We've then got some early 18th century timbers and uh, in this case, the main post is actually much newer, uh, cut in the winter of 1759 to 60, uh, along with various other bits. This wind shaft here, which we can see is now tilting so that the sails give you more clearance at the bottom and probably more efficient aerodynamically as well. Again, back into the catalogue, I'm afraid. Um, this is a windmill in Cambridgeshire. Uh, it's quite interesting because it sits in a village called Little Chishill and the listing for it says it's Great Chishill and everybody gets in a right old mix. So it's either Little or Great Chishill, depending on who you believe. Um, this is one of these mills that was extensively rebuilt in the 19th century. You can see there a lot of the timbers come from 1817, 1818. Uh, but we did find one diagonal brace at the front, which is an old bit of timber. Can't say for sure, of course, that it came from this mill, but it's quite likely that it, it came from an earlier mill and was incorporated into the rebuild. But inside is this rather interesting timber that is now used as a stud. It's a thing called a sail whip. And apologies to any of you who do know about mills, because I, I don't know much about them other than dating them. But the, uh, the mill people I were working with got terribly excited by this timber. You can see these little slots, mortises in the side here. They regarded this as a thing called a sail whip, which is part of the structure of the sails. And they said, well, if you can date that, it'll be really interesting because we'll be able to um, tell from the angles within these mortises and things a bit more about the technology of the sails that they were using whenever it dates from. And as you can see there, I came up with a date range of the timber being cut between 1690 and 1722. So probably a very early 18th century sail whip, which is say they got terribly excited about. Now, if anybody's got really good eyesight, they might be able to see there a little something. And if I blow it up, you might see it better. It's, it's almost impossible to see on this photo, I've read, but there is actually uh, a daisy wheel in there, a, a potential apoprotraic mark, or was it just the miller board with a pair of compasses having a doodle? Uh, it is interesting that it's on this on this stud, which is on the left side of uh, the mill, and the only other place I've found uh, a daisy wheel inscription was also on a stud on the left-hand side of another mill. Curious, or is it just nonsense? Um. So again, another mill, another Cambridgeshire mill, Great Gransden. This is in the official listing, the government listing, uh, says it's one of the oldest of its type in the country. Beginning to see a pattern here. Everywhere I go, they all claim it's one of the oldest. Um, often not true. This got into quite a, a parlous state fairly recently, but in the last three or four years, a group of um, enthusiasts and professionals have basically rebuilt this mill using the old timbers and, and it's now practically on the point of working again I think. But here again we have a main post not as old this time but an early 17th century post. Now these timbers as you're getting the idea now are quite exceptional. They tend to be very large timbers, they tend to be fast grown even growth timbers and they're obviously very valuable, so they get used again and again and again. And here we've got other elements of the, um, the mill, the right shear, that's a timber that goes horizontally at the bottom of the floor of the buck, uh, dates from somewhere between 1771 and 1804. Most of the buck, most of this superstructure, 
is early 19th century. And the wind shaft, the bit that transfers the power from the sails back down here, dates between 1845 and 1877. So again, we've got a, a basically a 19th century structure but incorporating these earlier elements, particularly that main post. Uh, there's just a, an illustration of how the wind shaft goes through, as I say, angled now so that you get more clearance at the base. And then this is the most recent mill I've been working on. This is still undergoing um, repairs. Um, it's often, yet again, said to be one of the oldest, partly because of this structure. If you go back, uh, I might have another illustration of it from a different angle where it's clearer to see, but it has this um, steep sloping roof here, very like those illustrations of the 14th century manuscripts that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so long thought to be the oldest mill, but it's known that all this trestle here, it's got carved dates on, these are 19th century. This mill was actually recorded in the literature in 1636, but there was known also in the literature that there was a huge storm in 1741. In fact, it's rather sad because it killed the miller in that storm. So everybody was expecting that although it had an old pattern, most of the timber was going to turn out to be after 1741. And what I actually found was yet again, that main post, uh, this is the earliest one I've yet found. I can't pin it down any tighter than being after 1515 because I haven't got any sapwood, but it looks jolly like you're at the outside of the tree and they've just knocked the sapwood off. Very difficult to tell with these. They cover them in sort of bitumen and things to protect them from the weather. So you can't actually see much of the, of the tree, but uh, it's a very early main post, 16th century main post. Uh, the shears, these bits that run along the floor here, uh, they were from trees cut in spring 1703 and spring 1707. So we've got another phase that nobody knew anything about. There was another huge storm in 1703, which went right across the southeast of England and in fact was responsible for getting um, a lot of mills in trouble. A lot of them were toppled in 1703. So it looks as if we've got a partial rebuild after 1703 and then um, uh, we know that it was knocked down again in 1741. But sadly, a lot of the buck of this mill is elm, and we can't date elm. But I thought I'd have a bit of a diversion here because there was some talk that we were hoping to get uh, a discussion on um, using epoxy resins in timber for repairs. And this was a survey done by the Cambridgeshire Windmills Consultancy, Martin Davis and uh, David Pierce. Uh, who I've pinched these photos from, thanks to them, so they get due acknowledgement. They started looking at these um, 19th century timbers, and there's a lot of rot in there. You can get a, a picture of it here. And this strange infill looked to them like a sort of sand and cement infill. Quite horrid. There's another picture of it, northern face of the Western Cross Tree Arm. Rotted wood being removed, exposed, and this strange looking sand and cement type structure has been um, put into it. So you've just got a skin of the actual wood left, and the rest is all this weird infill. Eventually, they found records and photos from 1984 where those repairs were described as epoxy resin. Um, I don't think Ed Morton's on tonight, but the Morton Partnership was actually working on this in association with the architect and the owners and they had to take the decision what do we do with those timbers they are so far gone um, I suspect that that decision has been taken by now I was there back in where are we back in March I think when, when uh, it looked very like the photos I've just shown you and there was a group of several people standing around in a field socially distanced umming and ahhing over these timbers and I'm afraid, although, you know, conservation is a wonderful thing and you, the, the, the theory at the moment is you preserve as much as possible. My view on that one was just it was so far gone. They were only 19th century timbers. My own personal feeling would just be get a decent couple of bits of oak and just redo it. But that's probably total heresy to some people. I'll leave that for you. 
Um, and they've also got other problems on those timbers. This is one of these um, quarter bars coming down and joining the end of the cross tree there. You can see this um, staggered joint that they have to spread the weight a bit. And you can see that it's got uh, a lot of rot in there. So basically all that 19th century bit of trestle apart from the main post is a total mess. And you can see they've got sheets of metal over the top and all sorts of things trying to, to protect it from the weather. But I just thought I'd throw that in as a, as a taster for what we might get in the future about epoxy resin repairs. Uh, there's a picture of the back of that mill. So there we are. That's um, uh, a view where you can see it has that profile that looks a bit like those early manuscripts. So this has always been thought to be one of the oldest. And it turns out with that main post that it might well be uh, have the oldest timber in it. But can we say that is the oldest mill because it's just a jumble of timbers? like all of them are from several different ages. Uh, just a reminder of that, that illustration I showed you at the beginning there, you can see the similarities. Lovely place. Uh, this is the inside. It's got a very strange arrangement because most of these mills, this is um, this crown tree, this is this large timber that sits atop the main post here on which the whole butt rotates. It takes all the weight. Usually you have a large, horizontal timber uh, put into the jointed into the end of this um, crown tree uh, which the the buck is all built around but this is quite strange in that this has this vertical timber jointed in a um, bit unusual this unfortunately this is all elm uh, some of this has actually been sent off for radiocarbon dating um, so we might get some results there and in fact the crown tree here is uh, a large chunk of elm as well. It's been found in other places. You can see that the, there was a mill, it's no longer there, at Morton in Essex, about um, five miles from where I'm sitting. Uh, this was demolished, but there's another one in Six Mile Bottom in Cambridgeshire, uh, which is mentioned in Friese's book again, uh, which had this strange vertical timber arrangement. And there's an illustration from a book uh, on how that is, is put together. So this is our crown tree here and this is how that vertical timber is jointed in and held through with a big metal bolt so just a, a bit of a an oddity an unusual way of doing things now uh stanley freeze's book i've referred to a few times already on windmills and mill writing there are several books on this subject but this is one of the quite well-known ones and he has this statement crown trees are of oak or occasionally of pitch pine or even ash. But if not oak, they should be quartered and reversed. And I've already mentioned that Bourne Mill has an elm crown tree, as did Chishill, in fact, and they're not quartered. They're just great lumps of elm, just a squared up trunk, basically. So don't believe everything you read in books. And then uh, stuff done by uh, other colleagues of mine on, on these post mills. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a catalogue, but uh, I think it's quite interesting. This is uh, Cromer in Hertfordshire. Uh, this was done by Ian Tyres several years ago. And he found an early main post too. He had a, a main post here uh, of a timber cut in 1678. And then again, you'll see most of the timbers are 19th century. This is Maddingley Mill, just off the main road west out of Cambridge. Uh, there are records of this having been moved from Ellington in Huntingdonshire. Uh, this was sampled by uh, what was then the Cambridge Dendrochronology Lab, which went out of existence. There's now a new Cambridge Dendrochronology Lab. Uh, but this was sampled by them back in the, I think, the early 1990s when um, Neil Loder was a member of the team. He's now a professor down at Swansea working on isotope dating of timber, which might be an interesting talk actually, I haven't thought of that, lovely chap. Uh, he sent me, and in fact, I've got sitting beside me on the floor here, large chunks of this mill in terms of cores. They took enormous cores out, scares the life out of me the size of their cores. Uh, but he sent me that, they um, didn't manage to date, well, they came up with a few dates, which I'm not sure were correct, but anyway, I've managed to redate it now. So we have a main post of a timber that's sometime after 1540, and then we've got uh, late 16th, late 18th, and early 19th century timbers, all 
in this mill. So yet again, it's another great jumble of timber. Kibworth, Leicestershire, done by the Nottingham Tree Ring Dating Lab. Uh, they dated 13 timbers from this. And guess what? It's not actually as old as everybody was expecting. So this is a mill that's the other way around. Everybody thinks their mill is old. This one turned out to be younger than people were thinking. Uh, timbers cut in 1773. And then one more rather spectacular tall mill that I worked on a few years ago in Hurstman Sioux in Sussex. Uh, nearly all the timbers that I could date from this were 19th century, cut in 1814. But I noticed a number of timbers with race knife assembly marks. Again, they were either elm or they had too few rings to date. So we've only got the 19th century dates for these, but I suspect it incorporates a lot of much earlier timbers. So uh, all I can say to sum up really, a bit of a short one tonight, uh, yet again, Dendro has totally changed our knowledge of these structures by giving us a whole load of dates. Uh, more studies like this could give clues about possibly the life expectancy of various components of these mills or the frequencies of disasters, fires and storms and things. But uh, to go back to the, the question that the public always asks of how old is this mill? Um, we have a, a, a character from a TV show in this country who had a, a broom, Trigger's broom it's known as, and he claimed that this broom was 100 years old, but it had had three new heads and two new handles. And, and I think most mills are a bit like that. Um, they're basically uh, complete revamps of all sorts of disaster. You rebuild your mill or you even move it somewhere else, put it together with whatever's at hand. And uh, it's very rare that you can give a proper date for a mill. A lot of them are totally 19th century, but even those tend to incorporate other bits as pieces. So there you are, my bit for tonight on mills. I hope there's something there of interest for you. I'll stop sharing. Fantastic, Martin. Brilliant. Love that. Thank you very much.